All right. One of the first serious attempts on this problem, I mean, there were earlier attempts also, but one of the first serious attempts on this problem was in 2000, uh, 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 a famous paper by uh, Bregler et al. And they said that we can solve this problem if I take a restrictive assumption on structure. If I say that the structure will be a linear combination, a weighted addition of certain basis structures. It can't be anything. It has to be a linear combination of certain basis structures. And let me explain from the previous slide why they had to take that restrictive assumption. Note that the size of this matrix that you have available with you as input is 2f by p. From a 2f by p matrix, you want to find 3f by p answers. Yani the number of unknowns that you have to estimate are way more than the than the number of knowns that you have. So the number of equations that you have are less and the number of unknowns that you have to estimate are more. So it looks like an impossible problem. And there is a good intuitive sense to, to the impossibility of this also. If a point moves in an image, I really have no idea under completely unconstrained condition of whether the camera moved or whether the object moved. Okay, So that's the multiplicity of solutions that is here. So they said, Bregler said that you can't solve this problem in the general case, but if I take certain restrictive assumptions about the structure, then you can solve this problem. And he said that my restrictive assumption is that the structure at any given time is a linear addition of certain basis structures. The structure at any given other time is also a linear addition of certain basis structures. So only the coefficients will change and not the basis. Okay, so that's uh, if, when you have a structure like that, you call that basis vectors. Okay, uh, so for example, uh, th there's a deforming structure of lips changing when I move from uh, being non, not smiling to smiling, okay? And that can be a linear weighted addition of some certain basis structures. Uh, the key thing that they said is the number of unknowns in the original problem is too high, but it will assume that you can describe the structure with a small set of bases. And so this k is smaller than f or p, okay? Uh, and what this allowed them to do is, this is the original equation. What this allowed them to do is to write this structure as a product of two matrices, the coefficients versus the bases. And so this 3f by p matrix, they were able to convert into a 3f by k into a 3k by p. Uh, multiplies out to still a 3f by p matrix, but uh, these are the, there are k bases in this matrix and there are the coefficients in this matrix. So the coefficients multiply with the bases to give you structure at any given time or to give you the entire structure matrix which contains structures at all a given time, okay? Um, so they were able to come up with a similar sort of rank restriction except the rank of this matrix is not 3 now as in the rigid case, it's actually 3k if this is a restrictive assumption about having k bases is correct and they were able to exploit it in a somewhat similar way, okay? Uh, so that work is already done. Uh, let me explain what we did differently in our research and why. Um, so here's an example. I have a video and I have these lips on it and lips are examples of a non-rigid structure because during the video they deform over time. Uh, while the camera is not moving here, uh, but the rotational motion of the head is sort of like if the head was still and I was moving the camera. So they are equivalent. If, if an object doesn't rotate, uh, if, if the camera rotates about an object or the object rotates on its own and camera doesn't move, both cases are equivalent in terms of generating the W matrix. And therefore, th you can assume that in this sequence, there is also camera motion as well as some non-rigid motion of the deformation of the lips. So to illustrate what Bregler did in his work in 2000 was that each of these lips over time are represented as a linear combination of a few basis vectors. I can, I can think of it as a space spanned by the basis vectors in which each of these structures is one point, okay? Uh, so, uh, so, so that's a bit of sort of ideas coming from linear algebra in here, but each of these vectors in a sense denotes one structure, one basis structure, and so how far away I am in this space is how, what my coefficients are that I want to add. So each of these dots here is one complete structure at a single time. We looked at this problem, the key thing to understand is we looked at this problem in a different way. We largely followed in their footsteps, but we looked at it in a different way. We said instead of thinking as each structure in space being one point in some basis space, right? This is a basis space, uh, which I can say a shape basis space. I'm going to look at these points in a different way. I'm going to look at these points over time, okay? So this is 
the blue dots are exactly the same as the blue dots here. It's exactly the same structure, but instead of thinking this as one structure, this as another structure, this as another structure, which is represented in a basis space, I'm going to think of this, the history of this point over time as one trajectory, right? Let's say the corner of my lip, how does that deform over time? Then the middle of my lip, how does that deform over time? Each of these trajectories, we will represent in a trajectory space over certain trajectory bases, okay? So, uh, in simple terms, it's sort of like they were looking at the problem this way, and we said we are going to look at the problem from a different way. We are going to look at a time decomposition of the problem. They were looking at a space decomposition of the problem. They were thinking of space bases, shape bases. We are thinking of time bases or trajectory bases. Okay. So our thing, that's that's how they represented their structure. Our thing is, uh, sorry, if we have uh, data, in this case, uh, this is uh, motion capture data of a person being shot. Um, so, so, so if somebody shoots you, that's how you'll fall, right? <laughs> that's, that's the motion capture data. And we have plotted the trajectory of one point, the hand, let's say, okay? So that trajectory, in our case, to contrast with their example, would be represented as a linear combination of certain basis trajectories. And again, a smaller number of basis trajectories than the larger problem, because it can't be done in the full case, yeah. Yeah, uh, there are a number of tracking methods. Uh, what you basically do is uh, every point is, does not have the same easiness over tracking. Uh, if I have a point in the middle of this wall, uh, let's say I was making a video here. Uh, well, I can't uniquely locate that point because this point is also similar. But if I have sort of like the corner of this thing here, uh, that is a uniquely locatable point. So what you do is you go through the image uh, sequence, you find interesting points that are easy to track, and then you try to find similar features in the next image. So that's the nature of tracking problem. Um, there is a lot of work on that problem over the years. Um, it still can't be done in certain cases. For example, specular surfaces like mirrors and so on, you can't do that. Um, but there are a number of cases in which you can get reasonably good results. Yeah. So, so for this problem, we are assuming that that's already available. That tracking is already available. Yeah. Like I said, uh, in response to an earlier question, that's a separate problem, and I'm just saying it can be done under certain conditions. It it might not be done completely reliably, but it can be done under certain conditions. It's a it's another research problem that has its own nuances. Uh, uh, in certain conditions, it's very easy to do. Uh, in certain conditions, it can be extremely hard. Uh, uh, humans can also be deceived in the same exercise. But it is something we do also in our mind when we understand the structure of a 3D scene, uh, both in two different cameras as well as with one camera. That's a process that humans also do as the first level of processing before you get to structure. And that's a process that machines also have to do. Uh, so at some particular time, I can give you sort of a tracking overview survey of <laughs> where the research stands here. But, but for this problem, we are assuming that somebody has done that for us. Even if it was a poor gradu graduate student clicking at all images, that's also fine. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, just, just a coefficient multiplied. I mean, 0.5 times this, but 0.7 times this, and so on, okay? All right, so in our case, uh, the, uh, the equation, it turns out, uh, I'm not going into the details, but the equation it turns out is similar but somewhat different. We have the camera matrix times the basis times the coefficients. It's, it's slightly different from the previous one, uh, but quite similar. And it turns out that if we have k basis, we also have the rank of this matrix W as 3k, which makes it possible for us to solve this problem. Um, so what can be done before I show you? Um, so here we took a movie from the matrix, uh, uh, a sequence from the matrix. And uh, I, first I was showing you just the rotated structure of the first frame. And then the structure is deforming over time. Uh, it's hard to perceive 3D structure in 2D, but once I put it in spinning motion again towards the end, you will see what the structure is. Uh, so that structure is recovered just from that video. Uh, the camera was spinning around the person here, 
and and we were able to recover this structure. Uh, and it's not, uh, I mean, this sort of a result was not possible before uh, before this recent paper that we wrote. Um, a few interesting things about the formulation, even though I'm not going into the details of how we actually solved it, uh, you can sort of look at them later. Uh, but one thing we showed is duality. Uh, the the shape basis space and the trajectory basis space, the two figures that I showed you, the way to look at the problem in space or the way to look at the problem in time, are actually duals of each other. Uh, so uh, one result that we were able to show that in certain sense they are equivalent also. The maximum compaction achievable by one space is exactly equivalent to the maximum compaction achievable in the other. Uh, in fact, the duality goes beyond that. Uh, the, this is the shape factorization of Bregler et al. Uh, this is the shape factorization that we have, actually not by Bregler, by a later paper. Uh, this is the trajectory factorization that we have. Our bases are their coefficients. Their bases are our coefficients. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a dual relationship here. Uh, in fact, that can be further visualized uh, by uh, the sequence, we, we we took this data, which is two different cameras, um, uh, and 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 got three D points from there. Uh, used them synthetically in our data set. What we were able to show there are actually two curves here: the white curve and the blue curve. The white curve is trajectory basis, uh, and the blue dots are shape coefficients. Exactly match with each other if you use the same method. Uh, understand that they are. I, I'll show you how they are exactly not equivalent in, in uh, uh, later in the slide. But if I use the same method, I have the 3D structure available. I project it through one method. I project it to another method. Then the then then both are uh, the same. Uh, I mean, the shape and the trajectory coefficients come out to be the same. Similarly, here we are showing the shape bases and superimposed on them the trajectory coefficients. They look the same up to a scale. There is a scale normalization that we have to do. So. One might ask, okay, it's a big deal. You found a new way to look at the problem. So what? I mean, you furthermore to 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 detriment to the detriment of your case, you said they are equivalent. <laughs> so uh, nice. I can I can look at this object from here or here, but it's still a laptop. Uh, so what benefit do we gain? Uh, actually, quite substantial. Uh, the crux of the method depends on of of all the methods of this category depend on how few bases you can use to represent the structure adequately. Of course, if you represent it with a lesser number of bases, there will be some error. So how few bases you can use to, uh, to get the same error in structure. Uh, it so happens that for natural motions, uh, the smoothness in shape over time is not necessary uh, if I look across shape. Uh, but most physical motions are constrained by physical actuators, right? So I can't move my hand randomly uh, from here to here in the next time instant and then back here or, or just to an arbitrary location. The way my hand will move over time is a function of the force that my muscles can uh, generate and therefore the acceleration that my muscles can put uh, uh, to, to actuate my motion. And therefore, the property that object motions are smooth over time is largely ubiquitous. Uh, it happens for most natural videos. Uh, even a video where, let's say, I have uh, bubbles blowing in the wind, the shape would be changing drastically if I look at the combined shape of the entire set of bubbles. Uh, but over time, each bubble is following a smooth trajectory, which is a function of how the wind was and so on. Okay. Uh, so it allows us uh, to 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 have uh, what what that allows us to do is to define a largely object independent basis. I mean the basis does not depend on what motion the object particularly executed in in this case. A basis for cars moving or a basis for elephants walking would be the same as a basis for a person dancing uh, in our case because all of them have this common property of smoothness of motion. Okay? And that does not happen in shape. And so what that does in return for us is to have a large reduction in the number of unknowns. Uh, because I don't have to estimate the basis from my sequence, which was actually required in all previous methods. I can just talk about a predefined basis now. Okay? Uh, and 
so so I can talk about any sort of predefined basis like Fourier transform or uh, discrete cosine transform or Hadamard transform or I mean there's just a whole lot of bases that are available that I can use. Uh, another sort of subtle point here is that while I said the methods are equivalent in terms of their representation power, they are not equivalent in terms of how you, what method you use for inference. Uh, by that I mean the optimization method that you are using. So because our bases do not have to be estimated, so our estimation is more stable and the errors are much less as I will show you. In fact, a further result that we showed after our first publication on this, we, we have recently shown is that uh, this is uh, perhaps the uh, freshmen here would not be able to follow this because they are not familiar with this, but most other people can follow this, that the discrete cosine transform uh, is an optimal basis in, in, in sort of representing human motion. Uh, uh, DCT is known for its excellent energy compaction for smooth signals. We use it in JPEG, for example, right? Uh, uh, yeah, th there's a result that says that for highly co correlated Markov 1 processes, uh, Markov processes of order 1, uh, DCT actually approaches PCA. So if the correlation coefficient is high and the processes of uh, Markov 1 property, uh, PCA, principal component analysis, which is the optimal basis, uh, is the same optimal but data driven basis is the same as DCT, which is then optimal but not data driven. So you know it beforehand. Uh, and our experiments on a very large data set uh, of human motions actually uh, show that it is very similar to DCT. So what we did was we took a lot of human motions uh, in 3D, not, not inferring from 2D, and found the principal component basis of that, PCA basis of that, and we found the DCT basis for that, and one is in white and the other is in blue, and they are very, very similar. Uh, but the important thing is one is data driven and one is not data driven, and therefore uh, you know your basis to begin with. Uh, this result you should uh, you should think of in terms of the equivalent result in image compression that says that DCT would do well for natural images for the class of natural images DCT would do well because it approaches the PCA or the Kahneman law of transform. So we were able to show that reconstruction errors of a 3D data set based on DCT and based on uh, I mean this is the same curve zoomed in here uh, based on DCT and based on PCA which is the optimal set uh, is sort of very close to each other. So that's a, uh, I mean, in fact, they're so close that I was really surprised when, <laughs> when Ajaz showed me these results, I said, I mean, you've done something for G in your code. I mean, they can't be this close to each other, but they are. Um, so what happens as we, uh, we, 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 we have to decide on the number of bases that we use to represent our structure. And as K, that's the parameter K. And as K increases from one, if I use one basis or two bases or three bases, very rapidly, I, I sort of, uh, adopt to a structure. So here is a movie where that's the first DCT basis in dotted line and the trajectory I want to approximate is in blue. Uh, so for k is equal to 2, this is how much the error would be. But if I play it, you'll see that for k is equal to 3, 4, 5, I mean by k is equal to 10, you almost have a perfect fit to that trajectory. So DCT does a really good job in, in sort of approximating these trajectories. Here's the reconstruction error as k increases uh, and, and it's working very well. So uh, let me sort of come back to the higher level picture again. Uh, we were able to show that trajectory bases are physically mot motivated and therefore uh, exploit a much more ubiquitous property of structure. Uh, there is a fewer set of unknowns, uh, so you can estimate them much more stably. And uh, also because you have the same basis for all actions, you can sort of use this as an action recognition scheme, right? If I was walking, my basis would be the same, so my coefficients would be in the same basis space as if I was running or if I was cycling. And therefore, there is a hope that all walking actions would cluster to the same location in that space. All sort of running actions would cluster to the same location in that space. And therefore, one can do action recognition uh, in 3D based only on 2D data. Uh, so finally, what do the results look like? Uh, here, I am showing you various different data set names of various different data sets. Uh, this is the plot for the error in structure. Uh, we, we, we took structures with, uh, we, we took known structures, imaged them, and then reconstructed them and compared them with the ground truth structures. Uh, so the white bars are for a famous paper by Shao et al. The uh, blue uh, bars, dark blue bars are for another famous paper by Tarasani et al. And the light blue bars are 
for our method and we just want to highlight that our method has really low error. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the error in the recovery camera matrices. I mean, uh, not you, you get as output not just structure, but you also get where was the camera. Uh, and again, the error for that is fairly low. Um, here's what the results for synthetic experiments look like. This is a 2D data set. Uh, the camera is synthetically spinning around a 2D data set. In fact, it might be for, for you as a human with amazing 3D reconstruction capabilities, it might be difficult for you to understand what motion is going on here because the object is deforming but the camera is also moving and in this case the camera is moving around the object as a constant angular rate. Okay. Uh, it turns out that the actual structure was, uh, uh, these are two views of the actual 3D structure. These were sort of cuboid blocks moving apart from each other. So with that inference if you think of the original video you understand what was happening. Uh, the uh, dots here show what the ground truth structure is, the green circles are what we have inferred it to be. Uh, and, and you can see there is a close resemblance between the white dots and the green circles here. Uh, since we are talking about 3D, we are showing you two different views, right? So that, so that you can see that uh, it's actually in 3D. Uh, here's another data set where there's a person, uh, again, no camera motion, but the person is rotating and therefore that, that's enough for us to get camera motion. These are two views of the 3D reconstruction. I mean, they do not always perfectly match, but they are very, very close to each other. Uh, in fact, for this data set, these are the results of the two previous competing approaches. They were just not able to handle this sort of data set. Uh, so the level of non-rigidity that we are working with is much more than what, what has been reported in previous papers. Previous papers was just talking about talking head videos with maybe lips deforming, which is not that large a deformation, rather than arms moving and legs moving and so on. That's another data set, and again, a synthetic data set. Uh, that's the input data. The camera is rotating around the structure. Uh, but those are the 2D input data. That's a visualization of the W matrix that I was showing you. And from that, we have reconstructed this. Um, since I'm short of time, let me just quickly flip through the results. Um, that's another data set. Again, you notice the sort of closeness between the green and the white dots. Uh, this is a data set of a lot of people walking. And so the non-rigidity in this data set is not just because the arms and the legs are moving, but the people are deforming with respect to each other. One person moves this way, that person moves that way. So for the entire data set, that also generates a deformation. Uh, but again, uh, for a, uh, such a complex data set, we got sort of pretty good reconstruction. For this, the level of non-rigidity is very high, and so we had to use a high K. I mean, we used 30 bases to represent this structure. Uh, in terms of real experiments, I mean, those were all synthetic experiments where the ground truth was actually known uh, so that we can do a quantitative evaluation. But this is a data set we took in our lab where these are two blocks are sort of moving with respect to each other as the camera is rotating about them, uh, and that's a reconstruction of the scene. Uh, this case was uh, more interesting from research point of view because there are certain specific papers that are specifically for multi-rigid structure, rigid objects, but more of them moving. Just on, and we showed that our method is general. It can it can work in the multi-rigid case also as well as uh, the other cases also. So here's another sequence from the movie matrix and you see two reconstructions of the uh, structure underneath it. Uh, so the structure is there in 3D. Uh, uh, the, the camera, we are not showing the camera spinning around the structure. We are showing the camera spinning around the original video as it was in the movie. Uh, this is a sort of a similar data set as used in other uh, papers which has lesser non-rigidity but the method works reasonably well for this sort of data also. Um, actually, with a very small number of bases, k is equal to 2, because this is not very non-rigid, very, very non-rigidly deforming. Um, finally, there's the dinosaur that we have in our lab. <laughs> um, so the dinosaur is moving rigid, I mean, moving, uh, but it is also sort of the tail is swinging and the head is deforming, and that's the reconstruction of the dinosaur. Yeah, we just didn't track them. Okay, so uh, finally some, some lessons learned. We, we learned while doing this that the reconstruction stability, that is the error in reconstruction error, uh, the, the reconstruction of structure increases if 
the camera motion increases. So if the camera spins faster around the object, we are able to reconstruct 3D better. Our experimental results show that, and that's also intuitive because you are able to uh, capture the deforming structure from four different viewpoints. Uh, similarly, the reconstruction stability increases if the object motion decreases. If the object deformation decreases, then it's easier. Uh, in the case that the object does not deform at all, it's the rigid structure for motion case, and our method actually reduces with case equal to one to the rigid structure for motion case. Uh, in fact, that's a quantitative evaluation of that. The errors come down as the uh, object motion decreases. So, conclusion. Uh, the what we have shown first is the duality of shape basis and trajectory basis in this problem. Uh, we are the uh, first ones to point out that the problem can be done in a trajectory space also, and actually with certain benefits. Uh, we uh, computed a compact pre, uh, we, we defined a compact predefined trajectory basis. In fact, we showed that DCT is in a sense optimal to do that. Uh, this led to a simplified and more stable estimation technique uh, so that we were able to uh, uh, get uh, better results because the uh, estimation process was more simple. Uh, there is a relationship between camera motion and object motion that we have empirically seen and actually that can be uh, a direction of uh, more theoretical work in that area. Uh, yeah, an interesting subtle point that came across is this. In the perceptual sense, it was understood by Johansson's experiment in 1973 uh, that to, uh, to recognize a structure uh, in 3D, uh, I mean to reconstruct a structure in 3D in our mind, we have to recognize the first. So I have to understand the dots that I'm seeing are uh, human and then once that recognition happens, then I can reconstruct in 3D in our mind. And, and in a sense, what we have shown is counter to that. We have said that the structure can be reconstructed uh, without doing any recognition if you impose certain smoothness constraints on trajectories, which are imposed through a, taking a limited DCT, uh, a limited K CD basis. No, no, it's not. So, so that's an... Yes, that's true. So, so we have not looked at the problem of how to pick an optimal k. In fact, in fact, our reconstruction error is a function of k. So, so uh, it, it's a complicated function of k actually because if you take two small uh, bases, then you just have a reconstruction because you're not able to represent the entire structure. Uh, if you take two large, then the number of unknown increases, and so the estimation error increases. So. Uh, for different uh, motions, there might be an optimality to this, uh, but that's definitely uh, an interesting question and an interesting direction to look into the optimality of how many bases to use. Um, but, but in a sense, what we are saying is, recognition every point in a sense is independent in its representation. So we do not have to look at them together to understand that this is a person, this is an elephant, this is a dog before we can reconstruct the structure. That is what the perceptual people say, ke hamara dimaag aise kaam karta hai. We are not saying ke dimaag aise kaam nahi karta. All we are saying is in a machine, it's possible to do it without, without doing recognition. Uh, so, so the perceptual guys are quite interested about this. Some people commented ke that might be a, a, a different way to think ke uh, why, uh, I mean, is it possible or not possible. Uh, actually, an other important conclusion for the freshman here, all the coding was done in MATLAB. So what you're learning is real and, and not, uh, sort of a toy language. <laughs> um, acknowledgements, I mean, uh, big credit goes to Ijaz Akhtar here, who's the PhD student working on this. I mean, he does all the work. I just go and give presentations and stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my my colleague, uh, Yasser Sheikh, who's at CMU, and Dr. Taki Kanari, who's at CMU. I mean, these are all the co-authors on the paper that I largely described here. Uh, there were several other people who provided us with data sets and had discussions with them at various different times. And for funding, I want to acknowledge the Higher Education Commission. I mean, they're, they're not giving much funding these days, but at least they were giving funding but <laughs> when, when we started this work. Uh, and the Computer Science Department at Plums, they gave us the video conference equipment that we use to hold our meetings with CMU every week. Um, finally, if any one of you is more interested, here's our paper at NIPS 08, which was actually also nominated for the Best Student Paper Award uh, at NIPS, which is a big achievement for a graduate student in Pakistan, but, but we didn't win the award but we still were nominated. Um, and we have a follow-up work actually in CVPR09 this year, uh, which is uh, more of a theoretical in nature. We have proven certain properties of these methods that were not known before for, for the non rigid structure for motion in general, not, not just our method, but in general, the problem of non rigid structure for motion. And most of this work is accessible on our website, uh, the Computer Vision Lab website.
uh, at this URL. So thank you so much. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I can take them. So you talked about the baseline when you were, you were discussing the eyes. Do you define any baseline while taking images from the cameras? And if uh, yes, how does this affect the trajectory reconstruction? Okay, so the uh, so uh, so baseline is is a term used in stereo where I have two cameras, and so the baseline for humans is roughly seven centimeters, six to seven centimeters typically. Uh, or the larger the baseline, the lesser your reconstruction error. That's in general because the the more wide I can put these eyes apart, the more further I can resolve my depth in. Uh, in a sense, there is an analogy to that in our problem because, like I said, the more the camera motion, the lesser the reconstruction error. So there is an analogy there. But we normally don't talk in terms of baselines in video. Uh, but we did the graph that I showed you of the error coming down. There is an equivalent graph in our paper that shows that if I spin the camera more, my reconstruction error is less. Uh, and, and that, in a sense, makes intuitive sense because if I'm able to quickly uh, why, why does quickly matter here? In non structure for motion, all that is required is I look at it from here, I look at it from there. Uh, in in rigid structure for motion, the object will also be deforming. So if I take a long time in going from here to there, in that time it would have deformed a lot more and therefore my reconstruction would not be as accurate. So the faster that I can spin around the object, the, the lesser my reconstruction error would be. And therefore these matrix sequences were not by... Uh, were not by accident that we picked the sequences. They were ideal for this case in a sense that the camera spun around the object fairly quickly. Any other question? The faster we spin around, the faster we allow the camera to spin around the object, the lesser the reconstruction error would be, which means the more accurate our structure reconstruction would be. We have more images more quickly, so so per image the deformation is lesser. I'm moving more over a lesser deformation. So if I take an awfully long time to go from here to there and the object is moving very fast, the reconstruction would not be so good. Uh, it makes both uh, intuitive sense, but we exactly see that from our matrices also. So, so, it, so you can exactly, no, no, I mean, I haven't shown you that, so you won't be able to see that, but, uh, but we have sort of verified it empirically uh, in terms of the mathematics involved. It's actually tied to the condition number of the matrix that of the condition number of the W matrix. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, not, not Nyquist criteria. It might be called like Ujaz Akhtar criteria sometime later. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you are right. I mean, that's a that, that's a problem that we have high up on our pri priority list. Is there a is there a fundamental limiting theorem here? And it looks like there is, and we have some vector on 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 how to think about that theorem. Uh, in fact, uh, like I hinted in response to this question, uh, it's we feel it's tied to the condition number of the W matrix uh, because uh, W will the rank of W uh, depends. Well, actually, the rank of W is 3K, right? But there's another uh, matrix that comes in within our estimation, the lambda matrix, and there is a condition number associated with that which, which ties to our estimation stability. And the condition number changes as I spin this camera around fast or slower and so on. Uh, and that part, that much we have shown. Uh, but, but it seems like there has to be some nice crisp theorem here saying if the object motion is so much, then 90% accuracy chahiye, to camera motion is so much. Uh, if we are able to find such a nice result, that would be something really wow uh, in terms of uh, a fundamental contribution to the problem, regardless of the type of estimation method you use. Uh, the result should be regardless of the type of estimation method you use. Uh, similar results do exist in stereo. So, so there is a nice relationship that one can figure out between the reconstruction error and the baseline. But that's because the object is not deforming. When the object is deforming, it becomes a bit more complicated because now you have to impose smoothness, smoothness constraints on top of it. So, uh, but yeah, it would be it would be really really nice if one can find such a result. 